Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. Our guest today bought his first investment property in 2014 and owns two real estate companies. The first is a home solutions company that flips homes and operates beachside Airbnbs locally in New Jersey. The second focuses on large multifamily assets in the Midwest and Southeast, currently hovering at around 150 doors. He currently has units in New Jersey, Indiana, and Alabama. Jason Yeruzzi is with Oak Capital Partners and is also the host of the Real Estate Investing Foundation podcast. Jason, welcome to Purchase to Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so to kick things off, um, what are your real estate goals? Where do you want to go with real estate? Sure. So I should update this. We actually have properties in Kentucky and Texas now. So we've moved a, oh. li a little a little into the point and uh, sold off in some of the other states. But nice. it's it, to accumulate, uh, continually accumulate assets that can really provide passive income and generational wealth uh, throughout you know, my family and allow us the opportunity to give back in many different ways. Cool. So th that's like a that's like a long term kind of thing. Where like, do you have any like short term targets you want to hit? Like, do you do like a three, five, ten year plan? Like, how do you kind of structure that to make sure you hit that? Absolutely. Yeah. So we build it out one in five years. Uh, right now, for focusing on the one year plan, uh, we do heavy flips here, um, heavy construction flips. So on that point, we're going to hit 16 this year. Uh, generally, ours take anywhere between six and eight months. And then on multifamily, uh, we're going to bring on 500 units this year. Nice. I, I like that. So with. Um with the units, I'm always curious because some, some people say I want to acquire so many units a year and some people say I want to do so much dollar volume. Why did you go with the 500 units versus, you know, like let's say 30 million or, or whatever it is? Good question, right? So I, I guess I could overspend and hit a dollar amount any day I want. Right? So <laughs> yeah. I've always thought of it on a per unit price, but or a per unit basis. Uh, again, though, I, I'm going to buy 500 of the right units. That's how we've grown our portfolio to a, a couple hundred units now. I'd need to update the, the bio there. But it's buying the right, the right units and find the right opportunities. And on that point, being patient and not really reaching to just reach a goal. So this year, if we buy a thousand units or 50 units or zero units, as long as I'm making the right decisions here. And I, I do feel that, you know, being to the point of being persistent and aggressive, we are going to buy properties. We actually have one under contract right now, but if we're consistent with our philosophy and consistent with our underwriting, we're going to buy a certain amount of units that are going to be right to add for us and also for our investors. Gotcha. Um, so do you have any maybe uh, daily routines or, or like how do you keep your goals top of mind so you stay hungry for it? Sure. I have three young kids, so I have to get up earlier than they do. So uh, <laughs> every time I get up, they're up earlier. So yep. today I got up at 4.15. Uh, my two-year-old had somehow already gone in and out, put her back in bed. But at that point, get up, get my time for myself. And that usually comes down to I, 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 about two years ago, I started doing meditation. That has been very helpful just to give my, my, my mind a second to just calm down. Affirmations, setting up where I want to be so I can stay focused because – just with a lot of things going on the second that the world seems to wake up, things can go sideways. So I want to take that moment to really allow myself to get back to it. So I work out a couple of days a week between uh, running long distance and also CrossFit. And then that, then I'm ready to really start my day, have my time, my family, either it's uh, days I take in the school or my wife and then just get at it. Okay. Yeah. A good wad's going to wake you up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with your affirmations, um, do you have the same, like, do you have five, 10 that you go through every day? Like how, I'm really curious about how that works for you. I, I, I use them as they continue to have meaning for me. And I found uh, a list of about 50 affirmations uh, that hit home on different days for me. And I'll usually cycle between 10 and 12 of them on a certain day from a, from a list I've found. Uh, I think it's, 
I, I forget that this site, but I have it just within my browser on my phone. I'll pull it up and I'll usually track, you know, one to 10 and 11 to 20 all throughout and do those for a couple of days through. And it's funny as I say, you know, 11 through 20, I'll do that. And then maybe two weeks later, a week later or whatever was that fact, be back at them and, and a different affirmation will have a different meaning and just give a different perspective to me that really hits, hits home. Yeah. And how much impact do you think doing that has had in your business? Like, can you attribute a, a large amount of success to it? Yes. Uh, and you know, you, it's, it's like, you don't realize the impact it's having while you're doing it, but you do realize the impact it has when you don't do it. So if you get up and, and you don't have that time or you don't have that focus in the morning, you can feel the shift in your, in your, in your day. And you can feel the shift in your attitude just based on that. You, you've started differently, right? If your body gets used to a certain amount of things, you know, whether good or bad, if your body's adjusted to it, it's a habit. Then if you take yourself off that track, it, it takes you down a different path and I can be good and bad, right? So putting these things in mind allows me to get on the right track during the day. And for that, it's, it's allowed us to reach bigger and accomplish more by really just having our mind ready for that when that opportunity comes out. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Um, so in your journey, um, you know, in acquiring units um, with your company, have you ever had any ideas that came to you and you thought, yeah, for sure, this is going to be a great idea. And then it kind of fell flat. Do you have any uh, stories of those? Yes. Uh, so you want to talk about, we could talk about two ways. Um, so let's say on finding deals, we've tried a lot of different ways to, to get phone numbers and mailings and, uh, and it hasn't hit home again. Like not like single family homes where, where you got to accumulate a lot of houses to really just keep the repetition, keep the, the revenue flowing. But for multifamily, I mean, you could die buy a deal a year, deal every two years, because right? you're buying a larger property. It, could just, it has a lot more buying power and a lot more revenue capacity. So you can find one deal, but we, we were generating so many leads that were just dead leads with the mailing. We're just not finding the right data. Not that we haven't gone away from it. We just haven't found the right mix yet. Yeah. Um, that has not been productive. We've also, on a repositioning point, we had large basements that we thought we were going to utilize very well because they were full with junk and we got them all cleaned out and they were just basically dead space still are. Uh, put in storage units, it really didn't cost us much. To, you know, it was, it was 10 storage units at a $2,500, so $250 a pop, thinking if we rent them out at $25 a pop, uh, it's a pretty good revenue stream. That has, we really had a lot of success on this one property, but the storage units have been a dead end. We've rented uh, three of them. We've actually, you know, provided them as um, little bonuses on a couple other uh, um, rental packages, but they just really dead ended, which we didn't ex expect from that. Yeah. Um, but so be it. Yeah, no, for, for sure. With, with the storage, did you end up doing any uh, surveys with the residents before? Like, how did you come up with that idea and test it? Yes. Uh, so when we were taking it on, we were actually serving what other properties were doing compared to our comparable property. We knew we were going to have a good amount of turnover on a property. We turned about 50% of the units. So serving some of the tenants, but it was a, it was a mixed bag because we were going to be changing over the dynamics of the, of the overall landscape tenants just not really that they they were bad tenants but they just really didn't have guidelines in place based on prior ownership so you know paying on time or, or actually just following guidelines that need to continue to make this a better environment for people to live they weren't used to that so you know new sheriff in town or however you want to call it you come in there and just put in simple rules that that help the the place be a better place to live ultimately people aren't going to like that. So we, we found out we'd have that turnover that would move in. Uh, so the storage rooms, we thought that'd be a, a component to really help the new tenants coming in. And it just hasn't landed. A lot of other things have, but for whatever reason, that was not one of them that did. Yeah, for, for sure. No, that's, uh, that's always interesting hearing about, uh, you know, ideas like that with the storage unit, you think it's going to work. And uh, for whatever reason, it just doesn't stick. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So is there one deal uh, that you've done uh, that really stands out as a keystone deal that really propelled you forward? Uh, yeah. So when yeah. we wanted to jump into large multifamily, we, we had dabbled, you know, we, we had done, I've done heavy construction as my family does, still does. We've done that for, you know, decades. And from that, it allowed us to, to start doing flips here locally. And then we started buying small multifamily out of state, just really following the path that other people were doing and just seeing the success with these silly two and three units out in, you know, Alabama and Indianapolis. We just, it just dawned that what if we could just scale 
and use this on a bigger, uh, just a whole bigger, I, I guess, uh, map, right? So how can we go up to, you know, 100 units, 50 units, 80 units? And it was really about getting our mindset right. And then also now finding out how other people are doing it. So using syndication, you know, we learned everything we could about the process and really just dived in to find the market, build the team, find the properties and start learning how to do the underwriting. And from there, we were able to go from a three unit to a 94 unit uh, rather successfully. It, it, it wasn't overnight. And that's one of the big things with multifamily. It does take a lot of work. It continues to, but we took that uh, three units to 94 units. We actually got it a million dollars under asking after a long negotiation process where we actually uh, offered, they didn't even counter. And we went back eight months later, offered slightly more and they cut their asking price down by about 600,000. And after about uh, eight months from first to uh, close, it was down from 3.2 to 2.3 million where we purchased the property. Um, nice. It's been great. We really did our homework in this property. And, and funny enough, this is the same one I was talking about with the storage units, but we've been able to reposition this property and uh, we refinanced the property after 13 months, gave about 75% of, of money back to investors already. Uh, we're about two years out in the property now, uh, but that's been a really good learning lesson. And we've used that process to rinse and repeat on other processes, uh, other properties after. Nice. So this deal, it was uh, through, uh, it was advertised with the broker, uh, it actually was not. So oh, okay. uh, say this, it was on uh, for a while, two years prior, went off the market. Uh, it, it, an elderly gentleman had passed away in his 90s. The kids were in their 60s, if you call them kids. Uh, however, they were out of state, were not involved in real estate. The gentleman who was in his 90s, he, he had a, about a thousand units, most of them made up of single family homes. So the kids thought, well, we want to kind of try and keep the single family homes. They don't seem like that much effort. That, But that 94 unit, that really seems like a problem. That one building that, you know, if you're on our side, we're thinking that's the easier one. Yeah. That was the easier one. So for that, they wanted to get rid of this and you could see it within the operations. And so um, some investor from you know, probably there, some investor came in and offered, you know, in the three and a half million dollar mark and then ultimately got under contract when it was out in the market. And then day one or day two of doing due diligence cut his price like a million dollars. Right. So, so that di deal died. It finally went off market months go down the road. Uh, we come in, uh, in, the property manager says, Hey, I know this property it was on the market. The, uh, the people are still interested in selling. We did our underwriting and we came in that, well, the financials were a mess. Operations were a mess. Management was lacking. The maintenance and the firm maintenance was, uh, was racking up. So we went in there, offered 2.1 million, I believe was the first offer. And they, they had a window where they wanted to be at 3.2. So they basically said, no, we're at 3.2. That's where we're at. And we were just too far apart. So we said, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And just went away and went onto other properties. But one of the things that we've done that has allowed us to consistently kind of have our, uh, have our finger on the pulse is track all the properties we've offered on. And it was a couple months later, maybe four or five, six months later, we saw that property on our list and on our tracker. And we were like, Hmm, wonder what has happened with this property. Saw that it hadn't traded. Nothing had really happened. Went back in there and we went from 2.1. We actually up our price $50,000 and they had gone from 3.2 million. They all of a sudden came back and counted at 2.6 million. So we knew that, that, the the whole the, the dynamic had changed they 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 won out of this property and, and it was on so we our, our max we could get up to about 2.4 but we negotiated back and forth and at the end just we showed them our underwriting we said hey guys we're not trying to to beat you up here but looking at what we're going to have to do to turn this property into the property that we need to meet the return expectation for our investors plus we're not local, so we're using third-party management. So our expenses based on what we're coming to is going to be much higher than what you're saying it is. It's going to keep us within this return framework. Sent that back to them and just said, so it's 2.3. That's really just the best we're going to be able to do here. And they looked at that and came back and said, okay, let's do it. And then we got into the underwriting process, which was a uh, whole nother point. We were able to go agency by a miracle because – Although you, they were 90 something percent occupied, um, that was of course, you know, warm bodies in some of the, some of the rooms, the, the effective versus actual occupied was two parts. 
but they had a very weird accounting process for which I don't, I still couldn't explain it, but they had uh, five buildings. They had the expenses and the laundry income expenses for all five buildings and the laundry income on uh, one LLC. And then they had the revenue for two of the buildings on one LLC, another LLC. And then they had the revenue for the other three buildings on a third LLC. So some magic in there that I, I have no idea. Maybe there's an yeah. accountant out here who's listening who's saying, oh yeah, well that, that makes complete sense. But to me, that was mind boggling trying to filter that all back through. So we got to, uh, took us a little, wa- a little ways to build back the financials, but we were able to get it done a couple months in there. Uh, one of the things that did help that process is when we go under contract, we make sure to put within the contract that due diligence will not begin until we provide written notice that we received all the items we've requested in due diligence. That was huge because, you know, day one started of supposed that they're supposed to, we gave them our checklist for due diligence. It took them the better part of 40 days to get us simple things like rent rolls. Yeah. And we didn't have that time in there, you know, 30 day due day, a 30 day due diligence process. We're saying, you know, we have 30 days and I can't get a rent roll to day 40. If I didn't have that within our contract, well, that would have really just been backwards on us trying to get this deal done. So that it gave us more time, which was good, especially being our first deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was funny because the broker said, well, due diligence is over. And we pointed back to the contract um, that was in there and said, nope, actually it was not over. So yeah, that's actually a really good tip for people uh, getting into a, a deal to include that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It, that I, I would always put that in there and that we put in there that units have to be rent ready. And what that means is we don't need them to you know, be in perfect uh, renovated shape, but that you're not going to say, okay, yeah, you can have all these rentable units and the day we show up, we're missing stoves or sinks or, or whatever else is going to be gutted to that point. Um, and that can save you on a few other, other instances as well. Yeah. And, and what kind of hoops did you have to jump through to get that agency debt for the property? Because I know you said it was, uh, you know, you, you got lucky uh, getting it. Yeah. So, you know what it was, is we, we knew that the, the format that we we're going to go for is that they were hovering close to 90. And so you need three consecutive months. So as, as operations are failing there, and you can imagine once they went under contract with us, they, they weren't pushing that property even, even less than they were. So just making sure that they could stay at that 90% occupancy to cover those three months. And especially that we had a little bit longer of a closing period where due, due diligence actually dragged on waiting for those items. Uh, that was one of the aspects. The other point is making sure that the numbers were aligning with what they were giving us. And they were all there, but because the financials were so muddy, it, it was making sure that the, the underwriting uh, team for the lender was able to build this back in the same way we were seeing it. So if you have this all split up over, over uh, three LLCs, which are mixed in here, uh, they were also blending their maintenance uh, repairs, which we knew was an advantage to us, but they were putting their uh, maintenance expense on record for this building that was actually for some of the single families as well. And so to try and separate that out to make it look like it was, uh, to make sure that it was clear that this wasn't all allocated just for this building uh, were some of the major aspects right there what else is it's, it's been some time, but it, yeah, it was really just taking it. And this wasn't, this has become our bread and butter. We actually just did a 48 unit that the owner had it for 25 years. We were able to go agency uh, again by the grace of God, because he actually had no financials, had no <laughs> financials, had no rent roll, had uh, three leases that were from about 2007 and 2008 but we were able to get in there and build it all the way back through his utility bills, through his tax bills, through it, through all of his uh, laundry income, uh, through what he was showing and uh, through his records. And he was taking a lot with cash, but we were able to build that back as well and use that to our advantage to get a discount on the property. But then again, get agency debt, which was, uh, which is which better format for the property because the property is hundred percent occupied. Yeah. You can always uh, start up a forensic accounting uh, firm if, if things don't work out. <laughs> I, I would think so. It's, it's, it's fun to do it only for a short time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so with, with this property, um, you know, obviously there was some heavy lifting on the uh, operation side. Um, what sort of game plan did you go into this property with? Like, you know, do you have like a, what's your hold period and how long did you give yourself to get things back up and uh, running? Sure. Yeah, we, we were psyched. We, we went in this, you know, head full of steam, right? Uh, so we had a plan here that we, we had 
really three different components going on. It was the capital expenditure construction items that we wanted to do for the property. Uh, it was the rent raise strategy that we wanted to also impose on the property. And then it was the lender repairs that were required by the lender. This property was, it, it had so many things that we could take advantage of. If you walked out of this, the door of one of these units and walked right across the street to comparable units, you paid a hundred dollars more in rent. Nothing different. The same vintage, you know, same rehab, nothing different. So we knew we had a lot of room to play there. We were able to implement uh, a lot of things in points of simple things like application fees or pet fees. All these simple things that were coming on comparable properties, uh, they were not doing. They actually said they didn't even accept pets and they had eight pets in the units. While they had there's 600 units around this property that was all accepting pets. So we knew this was a viable entry point that we put on there. We had two laundry rooms, uh, both uh, one was down and the other one was actually to the point where it was almost down. We sold off all those units, got a laundry contract on the building where they were completely taken on. There's a number of other buildings around there that has no access to laundry. So we opened it up to the other tenants as well. So it gave us a whole nother revenue stream right there. In terms of a uh, deposit, we moved off the deposit and put a move-in fee in place with a surety bond to track it right there. And then now that went right to our bottom line. We also put in a referral program as now we started to turn the units and getting people there that were great tenants. Not to say the other, the other tenants were bad, but they just find that process of tenants that really love being there. Uh, we put that in place. Now a tenant referral program came in. So if the tenant refers one of their friends and uh, then that person comes in, then they would get $250. So basically the moving fee, which is 450 was covering from that part of the, uh, the referral fee to the tenant. We did a water savings program that changed out all the uh, toilets, faucets, aerators across the buildings. That really helped cut our water bill down as at a master meter property about 30%, which on paper uh, brought the property value up by about 350,000 over nice. a really short time, which was, which yeah. was really sweet. Then on top of that, we had, of course, a six and 12 month lender repair items, uh, some being parking lots, some being concrete flat work, rail, railings were some GFCIs were, were another point. We, we tackled it. We crushed all these items in about five months. So we, we really just went out, went out the property full force. The rent raise strategy is always the thing that we don't we don't gun out, out from the gate. We do that conservatively because since we are syndicating our deals and we have so much so many other items going on, we want to make sure that we preserve occupancy so that we can meet returns from the investors day one. So we get to quarter one, we're paying out returns, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Because yeah. ultimately as you're doing this and you start to put in your rules, you're gonna have a tick, a, you know, an uptick, uptick in vacancy. That's just commonplace. So you don't want to force the needle by pushing out tenants who are actually good tenants just because they're being offered less rent. So we go in there, we do moderate rent bumps, maybe 25 hour rent bumps for, we'll call them green tenants. Those are green tenants that have been uh, performing, you know, good payers, great tenants over the time, over the history of the property. We take them up nominally, maybe uh, at six months and again at 12 months. Uh, yellows who may have, you know, slightly late uh, payments that happen from time to time, we'll take them up uh, $50. And if the reds were most notably because we did come into this property with everybody on month to month leases, uh, the selection of reds, which might be 10% of the property, we're just to take them to market immediately or give them an option uh, to stay at a, at a higher rate or take on renovated units at the market rate. Yeah, gotcha. And, and how long do you see yourselves uh, keeping this property, holding it? Um, oh, sure. Are you, yeah. Yeah, so fi it's, a, it's a five-year hold for this one, but okay. we've moved on to 10-year holds for the properties after. Gotcha. Uh, this yeah. property was a couple years ago, so we, we felt we were at a different point of the cycle. Properties yeah. going forward, we've been looking at 10-year holds, and that's what we've been putting up in that year, how we've been formatting our whole period. Gotcha. And, and uh, you had mentioned you have, you've been able to return a, a decent chunk of the investor's money already. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That uh, noting... The, the loan we had, it was a, a Fannie Mae loan, but it was a seven, six arm that allowed us to roll some CapEx into it. So we didn't want to have a floating rate. And we knew that going out of the, the, the ballpark, right from the start that we were going to get in this property, we're going to do some damage, make it better, make it a great property for people to live at. And then after a year, we're going to refi. Well, we were actually ready to the point after about six, seven months, we could have done it, but had a blackout period for that first year. So yeah. month 13, we refied from a Fannie into a Freddie loan. And the nice point with the, the, the Freddie loan, it's a, it's a 10 year term. So if we do get stuck and the investors, we've, we've had the conversation to investors, if you know, a couple years from now when the, the opportunity comes up, 
uh, we have to go back and talk about the whole period a little bit because the cycle has taken a turn outside of our control, we at least have that opportunity. So now we're into a great fixed rate uh, with a Freddie loan that really small balance Freddie loan that really gives us full opportunity to maximize on the property. Yeah, no, for sure. That, that sounds like a really great deal. Uh, that, yeah, that was some good was information. A lot of fun. So we were, we were, uh, we, we, we did our homework and we were conservative and, you know, looking back, if we know, if we knew what we, of course, you know, looking back at right. If there were certain properties that we probably could have taken down if we knew as much as we did now, but we were so conservative at that time, but it played out to our advantage because we got into the right deal and, and we're able to continue our learning process. But we kick ourselves because there was about two other deals there uh, that we could have really taken down as well. If we just maybe had that mental confidence or, or just were, were ready at that time, but yeah. that happened as it does. Yeah. Hindsight's always 20, 20. I, I've never met an investor that didn't wish they bought more property. Yep. So, there you go. Yeah. So how, how's, um, how has doing deals like this one uh, really changed you, uh, changed your life um, with real estate? So it's changed our perspective and it, that goes on many levels, right? If you can continue to accumulate assets in this level, it can really just set up your life and allow you to just have the lifestyle you want. Uh, it also sets it up that you can accomplish a lot and it, it, people constantly, we, we do a meetup here in New Jersey and a lot of the talks is I'm going to start with a five unit, I'm going to start with a you know single family, I'm going to start with a two unit, whatever I'm going to start with yeah, because they haven't, even though you know there, there's a certain point where you know, maybe they do that deal, but they just haven't gotten over that mental speed bump to say, okay, I can do larger. Because really, if you're going to do a 50 unit, you can do a 100 unit, do a 200 unit. If you're going to do a 10 unit, you can do a 50 unit. Because it all comes down to the numbers if you know the process and are confident with what you're going to do. And that allows you to have a different talk track, one with maybe the team members you have on board, but also with your investors. And so for us, we've been able to now provide great returns for our investors, be a, an option for them to diversify on their, on their financial portfolio and then give them something of, of a safe haven with real estate. Now there's of course nothing ever safe, but at least you have, you have an asset back uh, by real estate. It gives you a great opportunity to have cash flow, to have appreciation, depreciation, tax benefits, and loan pay down. And they've been very excited about, about it from that standpoint because the investors that are in the deal are most notably friends and family. We, we do 506B. And many of them never knew that this opportunity even existed. So it, it's been a great thing for them where maybe they had money in, a, in an IRA that was dying and they've been able to take that money, roll it over to a self-directed IRA and put it to work here and actually see checks that come back with, with money. So that's been a yeah. nice feeling for them. So that, yeah. that's how it's really helped us change is we're able to do a lot that can benefit us, but also be able to give back to a lot of people as well. For sure. I hope they send you Christmas cards. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <you go. laughs> oh, well, so J Jason, where can people find you if they're looking for some more information about you? Sure. Uh, YarusiHoldings.com, Y-A-R-U-S-I Holdings.com. Uh, you can find out about our business, our podcast, and uh, we, we have some helpful tips on there. Perfect. So Jason, just want to say thank you so much for uh, sharing your real estate uh, success with us today. I really thank appreciate you so it. Much. Yeah. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well on your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.